What do we got here? Well, it's a little bit more interesting than their standard firearm. Wow. A brass knuckle gun? The gun is actually called the Apache. Sweet. That's one hell of a pistol whip. If you got small hands. Your fingers are just super fat. <laughs> My grandfather had it. He passed away. It was sort of a thug's gun. I've seen where the value can reach up to $7,000. I don't want to go below four, so we'll see how it goes. It has a knife on it, too? It's a knife, brass knuckles, and a gun. Oh, wow. The ultimate self-defense weapon. I believe it got its name from a pretty famous gang that was in Paris. My understanding is that it was pronounced Apache, which meant ruffian. Awesome. How did you get it? It's been in my family for a number of generations. So you uh, my... got some real gangsters in the family tree. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like it. When most people think of Paris, they think of a nice place to take a vacation. They don't think of it as a rough place. But like most cities, they've always had gangs. Imagine having criminals walk around with a gun like this back then. Pretty hardcore. I don't think anyone designed anything quite like this. I mean, it's only a 28 caliber, but that was an effective round, especially at close quarters. This gun used 10 fire rounds. It's a really early form of modern ammunition. So when you wanted to reload, you literally had to, this came out like this. You would reload it with firing pins sticking out the side. So when you put it back in here, you had to be real careful not to knock the firing pins for the thing to go off in your hand. <laughs> Sounds pretty dangerous. And um, when you run out of bullets, all you have to do is fold the knife out. You know, you go to punch a guy like that, and when you're swinging like that, you also have a knife sticking out the end of it. This gun has a lot going for it. It's got an amazing history tied to gangs in Paris, and on top of that, it looks pretty badass. So at the risk of sounding really desperate, I really want this for the shop. How much would you take for it? 7,000. No. Um, it's got a retail value between two and 3,000. I would go 2,000 for it, because I think it would sell real quick. No, I, they're very unique. The least expensive that I would let it go for would be about 45. We're too far apart. I'd go down to four, but I can't do anything less than that. Best I'm going to go is 22. For that price, I will keep it in the family. OK. I appreciate your time. I'm a bit disappointed. Since we weren't able to make a deal, I'll take it home, and maybe in 30, 40 years, uh, my kids can do the same thing, and maybe they'll get a little bit more for it. What do we got here? Original blueprints to the USS Maine, 1887 to 1889, before the ship was sunk. That's really, really cool. These are the propelling machinery, and also 10-inch turret mounts. Whoa, um, I've definitely never seen anything like this. I came to the pawn shop to sell my blueprints of the USS Maine. I got these from an antique magazine. I've researched for over 10 years. They're the only ones that I know of that exist. I'd like to sell them because uh, I could use the money. The Maine was one of the first battleships ever built. It was over 300 feet long, massive armament. Yeah, the amazing thing is rotating turrets was such a massive advance, 20, 30 years Prior to this, I mean, warships, basically, you had your guns sticking out the side, and you had to line up next yeah, to each other. Yeah. These were like some of the first guns that could actually shoot over the horizon. These things would shoot like 15 miles. It's also the ship that uh, ended up blowing up in, uh, was it Cartagena it blew up? Uh, Havana Harbor. Havana Harbor, OK. Yeah. Relations between the United States and Spain were already really stressed. The blowing up the main basically was the excuse to start the Spanish-American War. Exactly. Um, the battle cry for uh, the Spanish-American War was, remember the Maine. Mm -hmm. When the USS Maine blew up, it was most likely an accident. But there was so much tension between the United States and Spain, basically, we wanted an excuse for war. This right here appears to be 
boilers. Yeah. Uh, these, I imagine, would be piston-driven steam engines. Yes. This is the gun. This is the turret it's on. And they would rotate on this right here. Mm -hmm. um, this is the back of the ship. This is basically the way things were stored. That is neat. So how much do you want for them? I want 9,000 for this one. I want 6,000 for that one. And I want 10,000 for this one. OK. Um, these are my big concerns here, OK? They're not blueprints. OK? Blueprints are going to have measurements. We have no measurements here. Right. So these are the preliminary designs. Before those guns were put on the ship, these were made. All right. I want to find out exactly what these are. You know, I, I got a buddy who collects all this military stuff. Um, do you mind if I have him come in and take a look at it? Not at all. Let me give him a okay. call. All right. Sounds good. This is an incredible find. This is one of the most important ships in American history. This inspired the battle cry, remember the main. The sinking of this ship started a war. If these are the preliminary designs, this could be worth a lot of money. The USS Maine is, uh, is an, it, to me, it's interesting because it sort of caused the Spanish-American War, not cause it, but give us reason to, yep. to go and get involved. The USS Maine is important more for its political history. And the US government had sent it into Havana to sort of let the Spanish know we were there, and it blew up. No one really knew why. The one thing we got out of the Spanish-American War, aside from the Philippines, was Guantanamo Bay. And as we all know, it's still around. Do they all say Isaac uh, Friedenwald? Yes. This one also says it, and this one also says it. So he is a lithographer in uh, Baltimore. He's a publisher in Baltimore. This is exactly what publishers do. They're going to put their, their name on the document. I don't buy these having been printed by the US government. They had private sectors that uh, did work yeah. for the government. Yeah. Point taken, but I've never seen government documents that have like a private publisher. They have entire buildings devoted to printing stuff. The ship was finished, I think, in 1889, and it was launched in 1890. What's the date? Um, 1889. OK, that doesn't make sense. Why would these be preliminary designs if? They would have had to have designed this years earlier. I mean, this wasn't. That's what I'm thinking. To de design and make a gun like this would have taken years. At least, right? Rick, I know what these are. I think these are propaganda documents. I mean, after the Maine sank, the United States government used publishers to make a big deal about the fact that the Maine had sunk and that got us into the Spanish-American War. These are definitely not construction documents, I can tell you that. I think they're old. I think they have some history. But this, these were probably printed after, after the Maine went down. No, I, I disagree. If you check the date, the ship had not been launched yet. So I believe you're wrong to say that these were propaganda or made after the Maine was sunk. Why? would a government take their top secret design for a new battleship and send it off to a printer in Baltimore? Doesn't make any sense. They're interesting looking. I mean, imagine framing these and putting them in your library. If you like naval history, this would be great. Other than that, I don't see a lot of value here. Tops, tops, if you really want to put something classic looking, you know, up on a wall, framed, three or 400 bucks a piece. Yeah. Am I close? Well, no. I, I want 25,000 for them. Yeah, see, it's like totally different planets. These are not what you say they are. These are what I say they are, because these were made before the ship was sunk. That may be true. OK, let's just say, yeah, they outsourced these for some reason, and these did have a pre-sinking relevance. Mm -hmm. They're still not construction documents. I mean, they're, to me, they're one of many copies made. And they were made for something. Maybe they were made for an official purpose. But I still think they're worth three or 400 bucks. So, so that's just my opinion. Thanks, Craig. <laughs> You're welcome. If anything, these were copies. They could have been copies made during the period. More likely, in my opinion, they were made after the USS Maine was sunk. Well, this guy may be expert on a lot of things, but he's no expert on this, I can tell you right now, because I am 100% positive these are not propaganda, nor were they made after the Maine was sunk. OK, I mean, it's just, it, that's my guy. I mean, I got to go with what he says. I don't think someone's going to pay that kind of money. I just don't. I just believe that there was a lot of these probably printed up. If there was a lot of them printed, where are they? That it's the only one. They might be the only ones, but I still don't think they're going to bring that kind of money. OK. Um, thanks for coming in, though. All right. We weren't able to make a deal because the expert's opinion was different than mine. I'm going to keep trying to sell them. Uh, somebody will buy them eventually. I know they will. Hey, how can I help you? Good. How you doing? I have a clock lighter that I found at my grandfather's house. Every lighter should have a clock on it. You could really burn some time with that. 
I decided to come down to the pawn shop today to try and sell my great-grandfather's lighter. I didn't need it, so I just came down to try and make a little money. I'd like to get $2,000 for the wash if I could. I probably would be willing to walk out of here for 1000 So do you know anything about it? I don't know a whole lot about it at all, no. This is neat. This is a 1930s Dunhill lighter. Dunhill's an English company, but I believe their lighters were made in Switzerland. Yeah, Switzerland. In the 1930s, we had a depression going on. Not a lot of these were sold, and you had to be very well off to get one. It was like $100 in the 1930s, which right now is like $7,000. Go, Grandpa. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Dunhill is a British company that's been making high-end accessories for men since the late 1800s. And their lighters have always been their most popular item. Of course, now they make a gold lighter that sells for over 13 grand. It's a pretty good idea. Something like MacGyver would have. It was made in the 1930s. Oh, James Bond. <laughs> Let's see if the clock works. It works. It's 80 years later, and everything still works on it. As far as collectible lighters go, Dunhill is it. This is the one to have. It's really rare. This That's great. Just this lighter by itself in really good shape, without the watch in it, they go for like $1,000. And in really good shape, they go for like 2,500 bucks. Super. Okay, now we have this problem right here. It's beat to hell. That might just look like a little dent back there, but it's a really big issue. It's worth like 1,500 bucks in this condition. I get antique lighters in here all the time, but I love Dunhills. They're known for their quality, and collectors love them. I just wish this one was in better shape. What were you looking to do with it? I was looking to sell it. How much did you want for it? I was looking two grand. Uh, two grand's not gonna happen. It's more like a thousand bucks. Uh, we just said it was 1,500. You go open up your own store and, you know, hire some employees, do a little advertising, sell it in your store for 1,500 bucks. Um, well, I really would like to get 12 for it. I disagree with you, the dent just gives it character. My best price is $1,100. That is the best I can do. The best. You're not, the, the nothing best. more. Nothing more. N not a nickel more. Not a nickel more. I'll let you walk for a nickel. Okay, I'll take it. Okay. All right, go write him up, chum, and don't play with it. When he first offered me $1,000 for it, I thought he was being a cheap ass. But, you know, we, we set it on $1,100, and I'm happy with it. What do we have? Well, obviously, it's a mace. Um... Put that down gently. <laughs> Will do. OK, do you know much about it? Yeah, I think it's probably from about 1550, 1560. This is really intriguing. This is like one of the oldest weapons there is, and it worked. Remember, we're talking the 1500s. I mean, they still wore armor. Just swinging this on someone's, I mean, you feel like Braveheart just holding it. <laughs> the price just went up. I've been here before, so, you know, I felt comfortable bringing something back in here. I collect medieval weapons. A real mace that's 500 years old is very hard to come by. I think that this pawn shop will recognize it for what it is. I mean, it's just like, what, like five, six pounds? Yeah. So it's light enough that a guy could carry it. Right. When you swing and hit somebody with this thing, it puts the whole force of impact on one point. That's what they were for. I mean, this right here is the equivalent of a bullet hitting you in the head. It's hundreds of thousands of pounds of force right there. You hit someone in the chest, on the ribs, they're going to break ribs. You hit someone in the leg, they're going to go down. You hit someone in the head, you're going to kill them. I love when old weapons like this come to the shop. They not only appeal to weapons collectors, but just average guys love these things and buy them. They're just awesome. What do you want for it? Yeah, I was thinking about 3800 You have some paperwork on this. Unfortunately, I don't have any provenance of it other than, you know, as it sits here. OK. You know, I know it's real. I like it, but I would like someone to look at it that knows a little bit more than I do. So I'm going to call my buddy Craig. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> uh, can, let, can we just do a deal? We don't need Craig, do we? This guy and Craig disagree on price a lot. Both of them know a lot about weapons, but I always have to side with the guy not trying to get a lot of money out of me. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, good to see you, too. Nice. Um, pretty amazing, though. Um, I, I'm assuming it's an old mace. I don't know if this is 200 years old. I don't know if this is 600 years old. Very interesting. 
I will tell you, when you look at a piece of armor or a weapon like this, there's always going to be a chance that it's a very well made Victorian era reproduction. So, is this one of those or is it a weapon? The number one thing to look at is that this is hollow. You can tell it's not solid. And why is that? Okay? A heavier weapon you think is a better weapon, but no. A weapon you can swing faster is a better weapon. That's why big swords, medieval swords, are light. The faster you can swing a weapon, the more damage it's going to do. It's physics. Do you have an idea where it was made? It's probably Italian or Spanish, and I don't think you're going to find a, a proof mark of any kind here, because remember, this was mass produced. Another thing, too, when you look at this piece, look at this pitting. You've got big pits, little pits, pits within pits. So this has been around, and it's been cleaned a lot. And yes, this is old. I would place this 1500s. This is a weapon, not a wall hanger, and that's what you want. We agree for once. Are we going to like bury the hatchet and go clubbing? <laughs> <laughs> so, what's it worth? All right. Um, I can tell you exactly what it's worth 2,500 bucks. I, I disagree. It's worth more than that. It could go as high as 4,000. I mean, you're right. I'm still going to value it at 2,500. Doesn't mean you're not going to get 35. You might not be able to sell it for two. It does display really well. It's a nice piece. Here's the real story. Craig's not coming in to help me make money. He's there representing the pawn shop. You know, what's the difference? I show up with my friend. He says it's worth five grand. OK. Thanks, man. Rick, pleasure. I try to say, what's this going to auction for on a reasonably good day? Uh, and in this case, I've seen several mesas like this go for right around $2,500. So in this case, it's easy. All right. I mean, what's your best price on it? You know, I'd like to get about $3,500 for it. I'll give you $1,800 for it. That's like my top, top dollar. You know, I might go for more, I might go for less. I think it's really, really cool. I really like it. Do you but, want it? Oh, I want it. Let's do $2,900 and call it a day. Okay, I'll give you two grand. $2,750. I'll go two grand. Twenty-seven. Two grand. I got to have more than two grand. You know, the number one thing you have to learn when you're in this, in this business, if the price ain't right, walk away. Well, give in a little bit. We got a deal. I'll tell you what, I'll give you twenty-one hundred. I won't give you a penny more. Twenty-two. Twenty-one hundred. Twenty-two. No. Twenty-one. Okay. All you right. Got yourself a mace. Let's walk up front. And we'll write this thing up. The only reason I could sell it for twenty-one hundred, I don't particularly have that much in it. If he's just buying it for resale, you know, I understand the man's got to make a little bit of a profit. Hi. How can I help you? I have this really cool piece. This was a prop in The Godfather. The movie? The movie, The Godfather. It is literally one of my favorite movies of all time. Unlike most people, I don't like the movie. Because when I saw the horse's head, I was horrified and stopped watching it. I have to say, the horse head in the bed thing is a real good way to get a deal done. I almost threw a horse's head in your bed when you wouldn't give me a percentage of the business. <laughs> <laughs> I buy stores lockers at public auction. It was in one of the lockers that I purchased. I'm not a fan of the movie, but I know that there are a lot of fans of that movie. So I think I'll be able to do OK. It was one of the greatest dramas ever made. It really was. I mean, up until that point, movies weren't this dark, and the characters weren't this rich. It was number one in 1972. It was the number two or three movie of all time up to that point, how much it grossed. It is considered by everyone an absolute masterpiece. It was a career-building movie. I mean, Al Pacino, De Niro, I mean, there was just tons of actors in those movies that got their start and stayed famous for 30, 40 years because of it. I was right around 20 years old the first time I saw The Godfather. I was blown away. It's got everything. Great writing, great directing, great actors. What else do you need? Do you have paperwork on this stuff? I have a certificate of authenticity from the Ellis Prop Company that says it was sold at an auction they had in 1999. And I have a letter with a picture of the jewelry box also indicating that it was in the movie. This deco-style valet jewelry box was issued to the set of The Godfather for use in background scenes. Now, do you know what scene it was in? No, I tried to figure it out, but I couldn't watch it. And it doesn't say anything in the paperwork either. So you want me to make you an offer you can't refuse? Correct. And how much would you like me to buy it for? I saw other people selling props from The Godfather, 
and they were asking for about a thousand dollars. If you ever go to a movie set, okay, especially big productions like The Godfather, mm -hmm. there's thousands and thousands of things on set. Now, if you were talking about the movie The Godfather, I'd want Vito Corleone's hat. The, the gun that was taped behind the toilet in the end of the movie. Uh, you got a $5 jewelry box. I mean, this is just such a small prop, and it's almost insignificant. This is the jewelry box sitting in the corner of the room that you got to see on set for maybe three seconds. I don't see this worth money. OK. I disagree. I think that there's a large fan base for The Godfather. I think that you'd be able to sell this for a good amount of money. Trust me, if I thought I could make money on this thing, I would snatch it right up from you. I don't think I can make any money on it, period. OK. Thanks for coming in, though. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. After they talked so much about the movie, I was really very surprised that they didn't make an offer. But I'm pretty positive I'll be able to sell it on my own. Hey, how's it going? Hey there. I have a authentic sign, Dan Fouch jersey. OK. This is the greatest quarterback of all time, period. And I know there's a million people that argue with me, but I really don't care. I grew up in San Diego. <laughs> I picked up this jersey about 10 years ago at a sports memorabilia shop in San Diego. I think Dan Fouts is one of the most underrated quarterbacks in NFL history. I'm going to ask $500 for the jersey. I'm not really sure what it's worth. Maybe a little less. We'll see. I grew up right down the street from the stadium. He was my idol as a kid. I mean, he really was. Me and my friends, we weren't the best of kids in the world, OK? Me and my buddy, we had a paper route. And occasionally, for a little extra money, we'd stop by the 7-Eleven. We'd put 50 cents in the machine. We'd take all the papers out and sit them right there on the sidewalk in front of 7-Eleven. And we'd sell them for 50 cents a piece. And lo and behold, Dad Fouts went by once and bought a newspaper on us. And uh, it was just like the highlight of the year. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I think, 13 or 14 years old. And he was cool to me. And I remember it to this day. Absolutely. If he was playing today, Dan Fouts would be one of the best quarterbacks in the league, no question. This guy threw for over 4,000 yards three years in a row. As far as quarterbacks go, I can't think of one that was ever better. Gosh, that is one blobby signature. If you didn't know who Dan Fouts was, would you be able to read that? I know it's real. How much you want for it? Now we can start around 500. Um, you have to realize. I'm telling you, of all the jerseys you find out there, especially on the internet, at a lot of sports shops, mm -hmm. 90% of them are fake. I would like someone to look at it. I got a buddy, he works right down the street. He's got a sports shop. Let me get him down here real quick. He'll look at the signature. If it's legit, we'll talk price, OK? All right, thank you. Be right back. I believe the signature on the jersey is authentic, and I welcome him bringing in any expert uh, he may choose to do so. Rick, what's going on, man? I'm just living the dream, looking at like the greatest quarterback there ever was. <laughs> Greatest quarterback in the history of football, debatable. Best quarterback statistically in the late 70s, early 80s, I'll give you that, man. I mean, there was nobody better than Dan Faust in that four-year span. OK. This was arguably the best offense ever assembled not to win an NFL championship. So you know, for a Chargers fan, you don't really have a lot of historically great things that happen to root for. So you're looking at the late 70s, early 80s. This was the time to be a Chargers fan. Well, yeah, a lot of my buddies say, what's the smallest building in the world? The Chargers Hall of Fame. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta understand, I mean, when Dan Fouts came to the team, they were a losing franchise. Dan Fouts was the prolific passer of that time. On average, their offense would put up about 30 points per game, which was just unheard of back then when the game usually focused on defense and running. I just wanna make sure it's legit. Okay. This is what I have here. This is from PSA's website directly. This is an example of a Dan Fouts signature. So what I'd like to do, we'll turn it over, we'll compare the two, the characteristics of the autograph, and I'll let you know what it is. OK. The signature is really, really blobby. Ah, the old paint pen, yeah. Looking at a Dan Fouts signature, you just want to focus on a couple of the key characteristics. It's a very small, compact signature, starting with the D and Dan. All of his signatures I've seen, it's a pair of stacked loops, with the top loop being significantly larger than the bottom. And then the F, that's the main thing you want to look at. It's a standalone letter. And the lower bar in the F is always going to be symmetrical with the cross and the T. Based on my experience, I've seen a lot of Dan Fouts signatures out there. Comparing it with the template, this one's easily 100% authentic. OK, sweet. So what do these jerseys go for? 
Unless you're from the San Diego area, grew up watching them, there's just not a lot of new collectors out there looking for Dan Fouts. You're looking at about 150 bucks here. Okay. All right, so 150 bucks. Yeah, so he's one of those guys where if somebody wants one, they typically already have one. Okay, well, cool, man, thanks. Hey, you got it, man. Thanks. Hey, good luck to you. All right, good to meet you. If this jersey was game worn, we'd be talking completely different numbers. You know, game issued equipment doesn't come up for auction too often, and when it does, with a player like Dan Fouts' career, it would go for thousands of dollars. Well, you heard him. I, I, I disagree, but. I'll give you 150 bucks, that's what it's worth. I want it for myself, but uh, that's what I could give you. I mean, if I, if I, if I go, go get another one on the internet for right around 150, I'll just go there. I mean, this was just in front of me right now, and uh, just brings back a lot of memories. So if you want 150, I'll give you 150. And I never pay people what it's worth. Yeah, just it, <sighs> think about it. No one's gonna pay you more, I guarantee you. I'm gonna have to bring you something else back to... Okay, well, bring me that. something else. I mean, if it's yeah. Chargers related, I'll pay more. I might but... have something else for you, so... All right, thanks, man. All right, I appreciate it. Thank All right. you. All right. All right. 150 bucks? Sounds like the expert's a Broncos fan to me. What do we have here? Um, we have an old clock here. Um, I was over at a friend's house and saw it in their closet, and my friend ended up just uh, letting me have it. I can see why it was in a closet. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to come down to the pawn shop today to sell my antique clock. It has six beautiful silver dollar coins in it, and it's just been sitting on the mantel collecting dust, but anyone would want to have it. So I know I'm going to be walking out of here today with a lot of money. <laughs> hey, Dad, come over here and look at this. What? This is you. This is your style right here. Probably one of the ugliest things I've ever seen. <laughs> what I think makes the value in the clock are the uh, antique coins in there. Um, these look like they're in great shape. They have four Morgan Silver Dollars. The reason they're called Morgan Silver Dollars, they used to name coins after the person who engraved the design, mm. OK? Uh, there was a guy named Morgan. He was one of the best coin engravers the United States ever had. He designed these right here. And the other two are peace dollars. And they came out right after World War I. Mm -hmm. In 1921, they started making peace dollars, and those are the ones worth money. But when it comes to coins, it's all about the condition. The coins are very interesting. They can be worth over $1,000 a piece. Wow. Um, they've been polished. Mm -hmm. Usually when you have prices, when you look in a book or something like that, there's, mm -hmm. there's columns, OK? Oh, OK. You know the very last column where it said good? Uh-huh. It's one grade below that. Oh, no. Yes. Polishing a coin takes away all the numismatic value. Numismatic value is the value of a coin above its precious metal content. Why does that destroy the value of a coin? When you take a buffing wheel mm -hmm. and take the whole top surface of the coin off, uh -huh. yeah, you've that... destroyed the coin, plain and simple. And you can see the hair right above the face there? Yeah. See how it's worn down? Mm -hmm. I figure that was just from circulated use. OK, all right, now if it was circulated, would it be that shiny? No. This happens a lot. People clean and polish old coins. They think it's going to increase the value. In reality, it's the exact opposite. But there's some good news here. A silver dollar's got 0.77 ounces of silver in it. And with the price of silver nowadays, we're talking some money. The clock is one of the most hideous things I've ever seen in my life. Basically, what you have here is you have six silver dollars. There's $150 worth of silver there. Mm -hmm. And I will give you. 100 and a quarter. And you say it's worth 150? I got to pay someone to take a hammer to this thing. 125, that's what I could pay. No more, no less. That's it. Mm. I think I'll just take it back home and stick it back up on the mantle where I have You didn't it. really have this on a mantle in your house, did you? Yes, I did. Better you than me. <laughs> All right. Have a nice day. Sorry we couldn't do anything. Uh, thank hey, you very thank much. You, sir. I disagree with them. I've had lots of people over at the house, and they've all commented on what a nice clock it is. I wish I could find the guy who took the value away from these coins. It really bummed the heck out of me today. 